All right, everyone. So we're going to get into the next welding process. This is called gas metal arc welding. Now, it was also once called metal inert gas welding or for short MIG welding. And that's because when this process was first introduced to the welding industry, the only gases that were being used were inert gases or basically what that means is the gases do not chemically react with the weld. Now in modern welding times, we've been able to experiment and find other gases that do chemically react with the weld, but are still suitable for use in the welding process. So it can be used to weld various types of metals. Obviously it can be used to weld carbon steel, which is something that we're going to be dealing with for the most part. It can also be used to weld stainless steel, um, aluminum, and a, a variety of other metals, but we're going to stick to those three as being the main ones. So carbon steel, stainless steel, and aluminum. And you'll find this process used just about anywhere from, you know, your neighbor's garage to mom and pop shops to uh, the biggest of production manufacturers. So, so this process is very widely used. There's a lot of advantages to using this process, but there's also some, some drawbacks and we'll get to all of that in time. So let's start looking at what, what exactly makes up this welding process. So there are some similarities between gas metal arc welding and shielded metal arc welding. So they both use an electrode. All right, they both use an electric arc in order to start the weld and basically weld metals together. Where it starts to get different though is where shielded metal arc welding used a constant current power source. GMAW instead uses a constant voltage power source. We'll talk about that as well here in a little bit. And then where SMAW used rod electrodes or stick electrodes, GMAW uses an electrode that comes in the form of a wire. So it's going to be much smaller diameter, but the, but this electrode, this wire is going to be really long. Uh, and it, you end up finding it wound up on a spool. Okay. And so in order to get the wire off of the spool and into the welding cables and through the welding gun, we need a wire feeder. So there is another piece of machinery that attaches to the welding machine that its sole purpose is to just roll the wire into the cables. There's the welding gun. So where in SMAW, we had an electrode holder. We don't have that in GMAW. We have a welding gun. I'll get into that here in the next slide. Another thing that you're going to notice is that we use auxiliary shielding gas. So where in shielded metal arc welding, the shielding gas was created by the flux as it burns off. In this welding process, the electrode does not have a flux. So we need to supply the shielding gas in another way. And so we have these compressed cylinders that you'll be able to see right back here. And this is where our shielding gas comes from. So let's take a look at the welding gun. So they come in different styles. They come in different shapes. You know, there are a lot of manufacturers out there that make their own type of welding gun. But for the most part, they're, they're pretty much all the same. All their parts are, they're similar. Though they're not the exact same size, shape, and they're not universal, this, the parts all serve the same purpose. So there's the welding cable that comes into the welding gun that supplies the current. There's also going to be a line that comes into the welding gun that carries the shielding gas. And there's going to be another line that comes into the welding gun that is going to supply the welding wire. Now there is a trigger down here where literally you just apply pressure with your finger or multiple fingers and it sends a signal to the wire feeder that tells it to feed wire through the gun and that's how we we get the wire out as we're welding. So then there's the gas diffuser which pushes the gas out of the MIG gun 
so that way it can protect the weld. There's the contact tip, which m literally makes contact with the welding wire. And this is how the electrical current uh, flows into the welding wire. And then there's the nozzle. So the nozzle screws onto the MIG gun and it serves multiple purposes. It acts as sort of like a heat sink or like a shield. So it prevents the gas diffuser and contact tip from melting, you know, depending on what you're doing. So long as you're welding with the appropriate techniques, this will act as a heat shield, but then it also helps to focus the shielding gas into one area. So without the nozzle, the gas diffuser would just be pumping out the shielding gas and it would just be going pretty much everywhere. It wouldn't be focused at the weld. So the nozzle helps to, to aim all the shielding gas into one area. Now there are different types of welding guns. So here we have what is commonly known as the pistol variation because, you know, for lack of better terms, it looks like a handgun. And then we have the spool gun variation where the roll of wire is actually attached to the back of the spool gun. So now this is a very small spool. These spools are typically like one pound. Whereas the spools that you'll commonly find on wire feeders that are directly attached to the welding machine, those can be, you know, like 10 pounds. And so here we're looking at a close up of the parts of a mid gun. So right here, we've got the neck of the mid gun, which is going to supply the welding wire, the shielding gas, the current. Then we're going to have an insulator. Now, a lot of times this is integrated into the welding gun. So a lot of times you may not be able to, to remove this. And then we have our gas diffuser. So this carries the shielding gas and then through these little holes, these little orifices that you can probably barely see, that's where it pushes the gas out of. And then we have our contact tube, or sorry, our contact tip which screws into the gas diffuser. So your welding wire is going to come through this and it's going to make contact with the contact tip. That's how it gets electrically charged. And then we have our gas nozzle, which screws over everything. So back to the power source. So let's recall that voltage is electrical pressure. And what is voltage used for in welding? We use high voltage to create an arc and then over time that voltage decreases just enough to stabilize the welding arc. Now the way that the wire melts off and becomes part of the weld uh, requires constant voltage. There's a lot of things that are happening that require a constant amount of voltage to keep that arc stabilized and to keep it from shorting out. Whereas in SMAW, where the only variable we were setting was amperage, with GMAW, we're actually able to set the voltage on our machines. Now we can also set our amperage, but it's not going to be labeled like that on our machines. Instead, it's going to be labeled as wire feed speed. So one thing that we, we need to get used to now is instead of adjusting amperage, we're adjusting wire feed speed. So the faster your wire feed speed is, the more amperage you're going to have. The slower your wire feed speed, the less amperage you're going to have. And this is because as you have the wire feeding faster, the machine needs to supply more amperage in order to melt that wire in time. And if you don't have as much wire coming out as fast, then you don't need that much amperage to keep melting the wire. So moving on, the wire electrode. Where it's similar to the ones used in SMAW is that it still conducts current. We still use it to establish the electric arc. It's being added to the weld, just like the electrodes in SMAW. So this is still uh, a filler metal as well. There are very various types of electrodes and where certain electrodes with SMAW can only be used in certain positions, the welding electrodes with GMAW can be used in all positions.
And then here's just some more information about the welding electrodes. So they come in different diameters. The most common diameters that you'll probably see are uh, 30 thousandths of an inch, 35 thousandths of an inch, and 45 thousandths of an inch. So those are the three most common sizes that you'll see out in industry. You, depending on what you're doing, you might see a little variation in that. And then the key thing here is that the wires do not have a flux coating. So there's nothing on top of the wire and there's nothing inside the wire. And then let's talk about the wire feeder. So I mentioned earlier that the wire feeder is used to supply the wire electrode to the welding gun. Basically, when you hit that trigger on the weld gun, that wire feeder is going to start spooling the electrode into the cables. There are different types of wire feeders. So there are some that attach to the welding machine separately, and there are some that are already built into the welder. Here we have a couple of examples where the wire feeder is a part of the welder. So this is one of the welding machines that we have in the shop. This is a Miller 350P. Literally, you just lift up on one side of the machine. It, you kind of lift the panel off and you have access to the welding spool and the wire feeder assembly. This machine, I'm not sure which one this is. It's just a general picture that I kind of picked, but same thing. Inside the welding machine, you have your spool and you have the wire feeder assembly. So let's take a look at the assembly because there's different parts to this and you're gonna to need to know what they're called, how to identify them. So that way, if we have any issues with the wire, we know how to troubleshoot this, take things apart, fix it and put them back together. So let's start with the drive rolls. So the drive rolls are these two silvery rolls right here, and they act as guides for the welding electrode. Uh, they they kind of act to push and pull on the wire to get it into the welding gun. Now right here is the very end of the welding gun. So the welding gun is somewhere off over here and it connects to the machine right there. This knob, is what helps to keep the welding gun attached. So you'll screw it in to apply pressure to the welding gun and it keeps it in place. And then you'll back it out in order to remove the welding gun. Now this gold looking piece right here that has a taper to it, this is one of the wire guides. And then there's one right here as well, although it has a different shape to it. So these are just a couple of tubes that help to guide the wire along its path. And then let's go over here. So this adjustment knob applies pressure or it applies tension to the rollers. So the more tension that you apply, the more these rollers are going to press on the wire. Now, in times you'll need to variate that depending on the wire that we're using. If you're using a soft wire, like with your, uh, in, in times of welding aluminum, you're not going to need as much tension. If we're welding steel and we're using a much harder electrode, then yeah, we're going to need to apply a little bit more tension. That way we can just ensure that it's pulling that wire through, you know, correctly. And then here's another example. So you'll find something like this in one of the, the welding machines in our shop. So we have two sets of drive rolls. And then we have two tensioner knobs because we have two sets of drive rolls. So we have one tensioner knob that applies tension to these drive rolls. And we have this tensioner knob over here that applies tension to these drive rolls. And this is where your weld gun would connect to right in here. And this is that knob that keeps it in place. And then we have our wire guides right here. So they kind of direct the flow of the welding wire. That way it's not just kind of, you know, going every which way and comes off track and causes what we call a bird's nest. Okay, so moving on. 
So there are different types of drive rules, just depending on the type of wire that we're using. So for welding mild steel or stainless steel, we're going to be using V-Groove. So if you were to pull the drive roll off and just look at, look at it from the side, you would see that the grooves form a V. For softer wires, like in times of welding aluminum, we would use a U-groove. And then for everything else, you know, if we start getting into flux core, we'll use V-grooves, but they'll have like little grooves cut into that. So they're, they're basically called uh, neurals. Uh, it's just a, a, a textured surface catch onto the wire a little bit better. All right, so now let's talk about the shielding gas. So with the absence of flux on our welding electrode, we still have to find a way to protect the weld as we're welding and as it cools off. And so that's where the shielding gas comes into play. So it's supplied from a compressed gas cylinder and we control how it comes out of the cylinder using what's called a regulator and flow meter. So here we have our cylinder, at least the top part of it. We have the valve that opens up the cylinder and allows gas to come out. And then we have our regulator and flow meter. So we can go ahead and adjust this knob on the side and it controls how fast the gas comes out. Now there are different types of gases, which I'll get into later. But all you need to know right now is that the various types of gases all pretty much do the same thing. They protect the weld, and depending on which gas you use, it's going to do some different things to the weld. It's either going to allow you to penetrate deeper, it's going to make that weld stronger, uh, but we'll get to that at a later point. So let's talk about the regulator and flow meter. A lot of times this can be pretty intimidating uh, for students or for uh, beginning welders. It's actually not that complicated. It's just one piece of equipment. It screws onto the cylinder right here. This is our regulator. And then this gauge up top tells us how much gas is left in the cylinder. So obviously the higher up this needle comes to, that's going to you know indicate that we've got gas in the cylinder. And then once we start using it and it eventually comes down to zero, that lets us know that the cylinder is empty and we need to change it out for one that's full. Now we have the flow meter over here, which is how we set the gas that comes into our welding gun. So we use this adjustment knob down here. And in order to increase it, we're going to rotate it counterclockwise. And you're going to see this little bearing. You can barely see it right there. It's going to rise as you add more pressure and then you'll decrease the flow by turning it clockwise and then that bearing is going to drop so the higher that bearing is that means you have more gas coming into your welding gun the lower that bearing is then the less gas you have coming through your lines and so here are just a couple quick diagrams so on the left we just have an image of the welding gun. You can see what the weld sort of looks like. You can see that we still have shielding gas. And then on the right, we just see another diagram with the welding gun. And we have a couple of new terms to look at. So stick out. So a lot of times you're going to hear the term stick out. And all that was all that's referring to is the length of the wire that's extending past the contact tip all the way to the beginning of the arc. So that's just one new piece of terminology. All right, so before we end this, remember, gas metal arc welding uses constant voltage. Instead of a rod electrode, we're using a wire electrode. And then there's also differences in equipment. So we're seeing uh, a wire feeder being added to the mix. 
And instead of an electrode holder, we're using a welding gun. And then for shielding gas, we're utilizing compressed cylinders instead of having a flux on the welding electrode. And that's it. I'll see you in the welding shop.